Hi everyone, it's Diane, EC facilitator with Durham District School Board. And I'm Amanda, I'm also an EC facilitator for the Durham District School Board. We're really excited to have Nancy with us today. She's one of the speech language pathologists here at our board. Welcome, Nancy. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here and participate in the conversations about oral language with our early learners. So Nancy, I think that for all of my years as an early childhood educator, I have always watched children go from cooing and babbling to, you know, formulating words and, and learning how to communicate with people around them. But I don't think I really understood the magnitude of the importance of oral language. So really, that's why we invited you here today, so we could start to have some conversations around that. So Nancy, I'm wondering if you could speak to the um, kind of things that could impact a child's ability to acquire a sophisticated language. Oh, certainly. Thanks for asking that question, Diane, because there are quite a number of things that will impact our language development. And I think that one of the things that we need to remember is that children who've had repeated um, ear infections or some hearing loss, um, they will not have had the same exposure to all mm -hmm. that rich early language. And so they may, not always, but they may come to school um, behind in their oral language production and even their ability to understand oral language because of that early um, hearing loss issue. Another group of children that may have decreased oral language when they come into kindergarten may be uh, students that are coming out of chaotic home environments or stressed home environments mm. where there's a different emphasis and not a lot of opportunity for rich talk. And we know from early research that the more talk that little ones hear in, the, in their early years, the more vocabulary they're exposed to, the richer uh, stories they hear, the more their oral language grows. So some children who haven't been in homes that provide that will come in with decreased oral language skills. Right. And, and you're not saying that as um, it's not intended to be pointing fingers or that something's wrong or bad. It's just an observation in how uh, the hours that they're not with us during the day impact what happens in their lives. Absolutely. We just know that a lot of families in today's um, society are under a lot of stress and a lot of chaos um, to uh, survive. And so what we want to do with these little guys when they come to school is to provide them with rich opportunities so that we can close that gap in oral language. Fantastic. There's also a whole group of children that come in with some um, biological or neurological um, diagnoses um, and they are not learning language the same way as their mm -hmm. peers. So mm -hmm. those children have a need um, for more direct and explicit oral language instruction. And another group of children that we're thinking about too are children that we don't know um, mm. what is going on with them. There isn't anything specific, but just they're not picking up um, expressive and receptive language the way their peers are picking up. So those are the main groups. And we have to also, because we live in Canada, think about our big ELL population. So many of these children may come with really good oral language and first language, but they're starting um, at ground one. Uh, Learning English. Yes. Yeah, fantastic. Yes. But yeah. so, Nancy, you we had a conversation one time where you shared with me that previously, like a long time ago, uh, we, in, you know, people came to Canada and we told them to stop speaking in their first language. And that is a practice that has absolutely changed. Could you address that before we move on? Sure. Um, that's old thinking, as yes. you indicated. Mm -hmm. um, we know that when children are exposed to good first language, um, families use good vocabulary, they use good sentence structure, they connect ideas in a way that's meaningful to them. And when children are exposed to that, they learn first language well. 
and second language always sits on top of first language. So we want to have really solid vocabulary, sentence structure, storytelling. We want that to be solid in first language so that second language can sit on top of that. So if we ask parents whose first language is not English to speak English, they're not going to have the rich vocabulary. Right. They're not going to have rich English sentence structure mm -hmm. if they're not bilingual. Yes. So we much rather have that child come in solid in first language and then learn second language on top of that. And then third and fourth accordingly, absolutely, right? They just absolutely. continue. Absolutely. Amazing. Yes. And even if that child, I think one of the key pieces here, even if that child is struggling in first language, we still want families to speak to them in first language. It helps them stay connected to their culture, and it also is the best for the family to speak first language, mm -hmm. and we will add the English piece when they come to school. I it, think that's really important to also pass along to families because I feel like working in a school that had a lot of different cultures and a lot of different languages a lot of parents would come to me and say oh I need to speak more English at home with my children and I would say no keep speaking your first language at home we'll do the English at school and it's also that education towards families too and making sure that they understand how important their first language is yeah I, I agree with you and we have an excellent um, English language learning uh, facilitators that would support all of that at the DDSB and um, they have some great um, workshops for uh, educators and uh, good um, pieces of printed material for families as well to support what we're saying today. Yes, because absolutely the kind of things that we're sending home in English can be translated into other first languages and if we know what they are, it, it supports that engagement uh, and builds confidence in the work that we're doing here in our schools. Right. Yes. Right. Needless to say, it's respectful. Absolutely. Yes. And I think that um, by saying they that this group of uh, children need an emphasis on oral language, it's supporting vocabulary development in the second language, it's supporting sentence structure development in the second language, and storytelling. And we know that those are really nice foundations uh, for them to move forward into literacy. Amazing. Fantastic. That is so helpful, Nancy, and what a great recap of all of the things that can impact our acquisition of oral language. That's amazing. Is there a great resource that we can use in our classrooms to help with our practice? Amanda, thanks for asking that question because yes, there is a great resource. Um, in the last past five years, Durham District School Board has been using oral language at your fingertips. It's a resource that was published by um, OSLA, and it's the, uh, the Ontario Association of Speech Language Pathologists and Audiologists. And really, it looks at um, the strands of oral language that are really necessary to support literacy. And I think that's what we're all about. We're at school, and we're trying to teach children to be literate and numerate, of course. Um, but what we want to know is what oral language really supports literacy. So when you look at, they use an icon in the book, a hand, and they um, look at the different areas of oral language that we can um, learn a little more about and so that we can embed it in our practice. They look at um, phonological awareness, they look at vocabulary, they look at word and sentence structure, text structure, now that's all your narrative um, structures as well as all the different writing um, methodologies that we will use um, and then they look at all the comprehension and inferencing um, that children need to know so I like those topics so I'd like to talk with you about those if that would work awesome. for you that'd be amazing okay so if we think about I'm going to go to vocabulary first and talk about that. We know there's so much research out there that talks about the more words children know, the more successful they are academically. And this would be knowing and using, um, because we are talking both receptively and expressively. And so I, I think that in oral language at your fingertips, there they reference um, on page 38, if those of you who are listening have a copy, they have a continuum of how um, 
vocabulary is developed. But I like to think of it as five steps. Um, so the first step is we've never heard this word before. And then the second step would be, mm hmm, I think I've heard that word, but I can't remember it. Third step is, oh, yeah, I recognize that word. I think it means, but not having a full understanding of that. And then the fourth um, step would be, I know that word. I understand what it means. And then the fifth step, I'm ready to use it expressively. So if we think of those five steps and, and vocabulary, we know that children need multiple repetitions of vocabulary across context, so not just in the same context, um, in order to acquire um, that vocabulary to be at step five where they're ready to use it. And I think about a story an educator told me about a little guy who um, was in her classroom and they were brainstorming ways to build a puppet theater and the children had come up with they would need wood and, and so the educator asked where will we get this wood and they named all kinds of hardware stores and their grandpa's backyard and then one little guy said J and B's and the educator could not get a fuller understanding of what J and B's was from this little guy so when dad came to pick him up she asked and he the father said J and B's is where we get our our firewood when we camp. And so that educator had that aha moment that this little guy knew what the word wood meant. He had a little bit of an understanding, but he certainly wasn't at stage five where he understood that wood could be building materials, that pencils are made of wood. He it was very narrow to um, firewood. So just thinking about that and thinking about the words we expose children to in our classrooms and the words we want them to use, um, we need to think about these five steps. And we have to think about what words are academically significant that we can use across context. Words like solution and problem and um, there's so many of those types of words. So I think that that's a really important um, thing to think about and there's a whole chapter in oral language at your fingertips that talks about how to build vocabulary from text you read from work that you do in the classroom and the nice thing about this resource is that there's differentiated instruction for children who need um, it uh, um, exposure a little different way. There's some key information about research and then there's a whole section on putting um, understanding to practice. That's amazing. That helps me to understand why uh, we've probably all seen videos of little ones counting one, two, three, four, and an adult says, can you count higher? And instead of saying five, six, seven, eight, they say one, two, because they don't have that whole step five of what higher could That higher has mean. more than one meaning. Yes. And I think that's another piece to understand that they might have partial and it's yes. going well, so it's, mm -hmm. it's um, in the classroom that they're going to have a fuller understanding and being at step five. So they might use the word higher, but in a very selected mm -hmm. way. So we want to grow that understanding. Mm -hmm. Just like the children in my classroom always thought I was the oldest because I was the biggest. Right. Now I happen to be both. Um, but for them, because we often say to them, oh, you're getting so much bigger, instead of saying taller, right. they equate bigger means more, so then you, they, it's all a blend, right? Age equals bigger right. and all, the, all of those pieces. And we don't really understand that until we push into it and mm -hmm. ask them to show me or watch their response to something. And a lot of times that a lot of these words are embedded in our directions and we watch children who aren't following our directions correctly mm -hmm. and we wonder what's going on there mm -hmm. but sometimes it's about them not understanding the vocabulary in the fullest sense so that's a great place to start so those are the words we need to repeat and we need to deposit meaning into that word every time we use it across context. So sometimes we ask children what the definition is, then we we help them make that definition uh, wider. Um, we ask children to use words. We put out materials that will generate um, that word being used, and we stand back and watch that to see where we need to push in a little more. So is there a guideline on the number of times that maybe they might need to hear these words? Well, you know, it depends on the child, okay. right? So we talked about children earlier that really need um, 
more exposure to oral language because of some of the situations they come from. And so those children may need a new vocabulary a hundred times. Okay. Another child may need it ten times across a different a different context. They may need it fifteen times. So I think it varies, but we know that repetition um, across contexts is the key. And when we start hearing children using that vocabulary, um, then we know that we've reached our goal. Um, one of the things we do know is vocabulary with emotion is stored more easily because vocabulary and vocabulary use is really about um, retrieval and storage. Mm -hmm. So we store that information, we have all the information about that word and what it means and then it's retrieving it to use mm -hmm. it. Um, and so sometimes when the words are stored um, with a lot of emotion, it takes less repetitions. So that would be a really good example of why little children who hear profanity might store that quickly. Possibly. Got it. <laughs> so we just talked about students' vocabulary, but what if we're moving into students who are having trouble putting their sentences together? Yes. Well, thanks, Amanda. Again, you have great questions that lead me to all of these wonderful chapters on oral language at your fingertips. And actually, Chapter 5 addresses um, some of the things that you're asking. Um, children learn, we call it grammar or sentence structure or word structure. They learn it in a developmental manner. And so when we think of little guys in the first year of kindergarten, we do have an expectation that they are marking uh, plurals or they're starting to mark past tense. And um, so if we're not hearing that, when they talk, we want to model that back to them. Um, but we want to be very explicit and make it a lesson, though it happened um, already or it's going to happen. And this is the way we say it and give them that model. So sometimes um, what I hear educators do is they give children back the entire correct sentence and the child has given them a sentence of three words and what's modeled back is seven words. And we need to remember that um, that child may not be able to imitate seven words back. So we have to look at um, what it is we're targeting and this is a great time to have a professional conversation with the speech language pathologist that um, services your classroom uh, just to set those goals. But it's really important because the way children put words together and their sentence structure and what they do with word endings really will impact their written language. So we, we, we want to target um, things that are important for children um, as they move through the grades. Um, you know, this is an also children um, I need to understand when we add um, endings or, or wor are parts of words to the beginning of words. So if we say under or we say un or if we put um, other endings on, what does that do to the word? What does that mean? And I remember a really good example of this when I was talking about moisten and children didn't know what that me meant. So we, we brainstormed what that meant and got a dry sponge and dipped it in water and we made moisture and then we talked about moisten and so there's so many words that have the same root that in, in order for children, I'm going to go back to that, that vocabulary section we talked about and for children to have a full understanding to be at step five and being able to use vocabulary, understanding all the bits and pieces that go with that word will also be important. And you know what, there's lots on in the chapter on chapter five on word and sentence structure, there's a whole developmental list on page 53 that you can look at and one if you're wondering whether or not what you're hearing from your student is um, appropriate. So that may guide you and lots of great recommendations on how do we do this? How do we model? How do we target um, to really help children grow better word and sentence structure so that it's going to impact their writing in a positive way? So if a child said, I go to the park, how would you respond to that? I guess I'd affirm that I understood what he was mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. And then I'd say, oh, when did this happen? Did you go yesterday? Did you go on um, this morning? And just get a sense. And children don't 
really young children don't have a sense of what's the difference between yesterday and mm -hmm. in a week ago but you're just trying to get a sense of when they went and then you would I would very explicitly say we say I went and then maybe look at all of the things that you've done in the past and then practice I went to the park, I went to the store, I went to the office, um, if that's the target that you're working on. Okay. Because yeah. I think when we don't let children know the why, mm -hmm. why are we changing this, mm -hmm. um, then it's, it's less likely to happen um, that they're just going to start to change it in their language. Yeah, it, and then they need to sense, practice, right? For sure, because that makes sense that if I said to a child, where did you go? I go to the park. It makes sense when the tri when a child is trying to make go into a past tense right. word. So without that explicit went. Right. And in, 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 in a first year kindergarten, children are just starting to, that we call those irregular past mm -hmm. um, tenses, and they're just starting to acquire them. So I think that... Um, helping them understand that this is the word we use and then helping them understand when they're going to use it is, will be important. Amazing. Another one that I notice a lot in kindergarten is knowing how to make more than one thing. So if I went to the farm and I saw three pig and making that very explicit that I saw three pigs right. with that ending on the, the S ending for that plural. Right and having those explicit teaching moments where we're talking about how do we write or say that there was more than one. Correct, yes. And really saying when we put that s or z sound at the end, depending on the word, that that means there's more than one. And just really having um, children understand that. And you might see then an overgeneralization. Um, and we always do, we do see that sometimes when we're teaching something new, we see it being applied all over. And But as, over time, we start to um, hone that and change that, those practices. Yeah. And that really ties into when they start writing, too, is that they need to know that there is that S sound at the end of the plural so that they can translate that when they're starting to write also. Right, right. And then, and then as we move forward, knowing when you use ES versus yes. just S, right? And, and why does that S sometimes sound like a Z? English is very complex. <laughs> it's not easy. And so we don't want to overwhelm them by correcting them all the time, but that's where that, I think we talked about that earlier, that conversation with uh, the speech-language pathologist in terms of um, what would best um, be targeted, and that would be important. Okay, Nancy, so as an early childhood educator, I wanna know, how do you embed all this great oral language in your classroom? What's a great way to do it? Well, Amanda, just thinking about that makes me think about some of the work that comes out of, um, it's, it's actually Dickinson, he was an early childhood educator, and way back in 2001, he coined a phrase, strive for five. Mm. And it's about having a conversation with a child. And I think that I wanna talk a little bit about what we can do in a conversation um, when we have five terms. So the strive for five um, relates to having five turns. So not the child's five turns and your five turns, but back and forth combination of five turns. Um, and I think that when we take time to have a conversation that has five turns with a child, we can really, within that, we're following their lead, but we can expand their vocabulary, we can model good sentence structure, we can help them connect to previous learning. So, so many things can happen, and we can excite the child to continue on with that learning. What we end up doing sometimes, especially um, as we're thinking about inquiry-based learning, is we ask big questions. We ask children big questions, they answer them, and then we move on and ask another child a big question but we don't settle and have that conversation mm -hmm. so I think about a child that might come up to you and say hey look I made a big car and have a Lego um, representation of a car and showing you and you know what you're acknowledging wow that is a huge vehicle so now you've bumped up the word 
big to huge and you've changed the word car to vehicle and you're saying wow that's a huge vehicle you've created I wonder where your vehicle is going and so you're opening it up because you want to keep on you want to find out what that child's thinking about right mm -hmm. and that child might say something to you like it's going to Africa and and you might say wow Africa so now you're gonna build knowledge he knows something about Africa. Maybe you've had uh, the map out or the globe out and you've been talking about different places. But you're saying Africa's a really far way away. So I, it's going to take you a really long time to get to Africa. So now you're building some knowledge about distance. Um, and that child may come back to you and say, no, I built a speedy motor and it's going to fly there in, you know, two minutes. So, but within that conversation you have that opportunity to explore their thinking to grow their vocabulary model sentences help them make connections and it's also relationship building right that back and forth that you took that time to have a moment with that child so i think that we think about strive for five you can't do it with every child every day mm -hmm. but if we're thinking about how we had conversations that are five turns in length with at least every child once a week, once every two weeks. Um, that's something to think about for um, us in the classroom. Yeah, I, I think back to being in the classroom and having those moments of going home at night and thinking like, did I even mm. have any conversations yes. with my students today? And I didn't really learn anything new about them today because that's always was my goal, to learn about my students and learn about what they're thinking of, what their interests are. And thinking about it within the context of Strive for Five, now that gives you permission to take that time out of your day and have those amazing conversations. Whereas sometimes I would have just said, oh, that's a great car and kind of just brushed it off. And sometimes and you have to say yes, of because course, of yes. other things that are going on, mm -hmm. okay, that's mm -hmm. a great car. But when you're, th when you're intentionally thinking about Strive for Five, then those opportunities present themselves. You know, if you have that time that you can do that at that moment will make a big difference. Yes, and I, I love the concept of the Strive for Five and being able to really visualize having those conversations and the importance behind the thinking that's happening during those conversations too. I think that would be a really great piece to share with families as well so that they're sort of getting on board with understanding that there it's a conversation it's not just a direction and and engaging their kids so that would be a tremendous thing for a family engagement piece. Yeah, and I think it's that whole idea that we're very purposeful and intentional in the conversation as well. We're listening to the words the child says. We're thinking about how can we grow vocabulary, that's oral language. We're, think, we're listening to the sentence structure the child is using. How can we expand it or make it more interesting? And we're thinking about prior knowledge the child might have. And we're trying to connect to that so that it becomes a very rich experience. And when you say all of that, Nancy, I, like I think to myself, you know, I'm sure I've kind of done that, but it feels a little almost overwhelming when you say it. So this is something that I could really lean into and, you know, just slowly sort of, you know, pull these pieces in for myself, right? So Absolutely. So this is, uh, and now, oh, and I did this this time, and, and, and then it will become a natural sort of piece that we're yeah. continuing to do, right? I think we've made a lot of movement in this direction with all the big questions we're asking mm -hmm. children today. Um, but now it's like, stay put with that question yes. and and maybe not it's not you initiating maybe it's the child initiating the conversation because we want them to initiate not just be responders because that's the whole yes. point of a conversation uh -huh. sometimes you initiate sometimes you respond and it's that back and forth and it's also a beautiful opportunity to teach social skills um, within the conversation like staying on the same topic, um, how close we stand to the individual, mm -hmm. do we, are we looking at the individual, mm -hmm. do we care about what they think, are we waiting and listening. So that whole idea of a conversation we can use in many different ways in the classroom to um, really help the children move forward in oral language. It's a really fascinating uh, idea to me and, I, and I'm thinking about um, apps that are available on phones or 
uh, any number of technological devices. Quick aside, I was in the grocery store recently, and the number of children who were just looking at a parent or who you know the grown up with them's device instead of you know do you want blueberries this week or do you want like a red apple as opposed to a yellow apple for example um, and those things aren't happening and so the technology is just talking at the children yeah I mean I think as speech language pathologists we always are really interested in that face-to-face -face communication because the words are spoken, but then we have all the gestures and the intonation, and we have um, all of the body language that's part of language as well. And so that back and forth is really, really important. We're always talking with parents about that face-to-face -face because it's the beginning of the conversation. And within the conversation, rich things can happen that can't happen um, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an app. So sure. I think that we want to make sure we have enough opportunity for face-to-face -face and to interaction and to, to prolong the interaction with the child to not only build relationship, although that's a really key piece because learning happens in relationship as well, mm -hmm. but also to really be able to um, explore the child's thinking and to push into that a little bit. And I like how you said in them initiating the conversation too because they're already invested now because it's something that they're excited to yes. share with you there's something that they want to talk about so continuing that conversation and letting them initiate the conversation is also great to make sure that they're engaged and so as an educator you are always looking for those opportunities so you're not always the initiator right there are opportunities when the child comes to you or the child's doing something and I think Diane we work um, on another project together and you talked about um, just approaching well tell me what you're doing so that open-ended statement that allows the child you started it but they're going to mm -hmm. really initiate the content mm -hmm. yeah. okay. that's a really great rich question and to like you're saying be there with them and stay in that moment of listening to what it is the child's telling you because that's where you're going to get the gold that's where uh, we can be gathering information in our kindergarten programs uh, that will help us attract children's growth and learning and all of the things. And, and we might find three other children on the carpet or at the table or wherever are also interested in that. And so instead of it just being a question that goes up on a wonder wall, for example, it might actually spark things and suddenly we're at the library getting books and and the and yes and and the conversation can um, include those other children mm -hmm. it doesn't your yes. turn you can have one or two turns mm -hmm. but maybe the other children are going to go back and forth um, so that it becomes rich and and just enjoyable and being together and you know capitalizing on those authentic opportunities Thank you so much for joining us for part one of our discussion about oral language with Nancy. We will be bringing you part two of this amazing conversation in the next few weeks. So make sure you are subscribed to the Early Years podcast and you're following us on social media. We're at DDSB Early Years on Instagram and Twitter. Hope to see you next time.